welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. One thing that created a lot of burnout and angst for me was trying to get continued medical education right at the last minute. So why not join the CME membership and do CME while listening to this podcast? Go to psychiatrypodcast.com, sign up, sign in, take the test, and the certification is emailed to you in seconds. All right, welcome back to the podcast. Before we begin this episode with Norman Holler and Adam Brecky, I wanted to introduce the idea that we're going to be talking about today and give you some a little bit of scientific sort of knowledge before we start the episode. So in this episode, we are going to be discussing methamphetamines, Nazi Germany, Hitler, um, we're going to be talking about war and how in war they used methamphetamines and amphetamines to basically act as a performance enhancer. And we're talking about tablets of Pervitin, which are three milligrams of methamphetamine. And usually they would take three to five of these over maybe the course of a couple hours or a couple days, we know that 35 million dosages were ordered before the Blitzkrieg, which we'll talk about the details of that when Germany invaded France and 3 million German troops marched 22 miles per day under fire. So those 35 million dosages were split up between those 3 million German troops. We also know that, uh, and we don't really go into this in this episode, but General Eisenhower ordered one half million dosages of benzodrine sulfate, which is amphetamine sulfate. It's not methamphetamine, it's amphetamine sulfate. And these were in five milligram tablets and about 20 milligrams was consumed maybe per day. And you know, this, this was used by American troops, in this case, to sort of break through German lines to increase a sense of power, to increase aggressiveness, and to decrease fear. We will also talk about how, you know, other things were used, like oxycodone, cocaine. And I think what's interesting as I reflect upon this episode is, you know, Although these are lower dosages than may be used by people who are using it illicitly or chronically, which may be using 300 to 800 milligrams of methamphetamines per day, this is still something that enhanced and changed personality, changed behavior. I think just even at those low doses, you have an incredibly increased confidence, aggression, and less fatigue. And so they were able to do things like march 22 miles while under fire per day through the the French lines. And then, you know, they were able to cut the telephone wires. So basically made the, the French armies up at the front completely without communication on what was going on. So we will get into more details. And if you stay towards the end, Me and Dr. Brecky will have kind of a reflection on the episode. He's going to talk about some studies that he found and um, sort of reflections that we have had since recording this. I hope this is of interest to you. And, you know, this is kind of bridging where something that influences the mind meets kind of an aspect that we're not used to, which is war and thinking through Uh, addiction, thinking through how drugs are used. And so I hope that this is of interest to you. We also talk about Hitler and his um, use of all sorts of drugs, including, you know, injecting them with like distilled testes of bulls and stuff like that. And, you know, we, we talk about complicated ethical issues like was Hitler responsible for his ideology? Did his ideology predate his use of drugs? Which we will discuss that, yes, it predated, um, his ideology predated his use of drugs. He was actually pretty clean early on. So 
Welcome to the episode. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm joined today by Norman Holler and Adam Brecky. Adam Brecky has been on previous podcasts like Cognitive Distortions. Norman Oler has written a book called Blitzed Drugs in the Third Reich. And I thought it would be interesting to have him on to talk about his his book, his research in this, and the kind of the psychology of Nazi Germany, how drugs influenced both Hitler and the soldiers. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good morning. Kind of, it kind of seems like initially before World War II time, before Nazi Germany came to power, there was a lot of methamphetamines used mm-hmm. in Germany. There was a lot of drugs used. And the sort of the Nazi banner initially was, we're going to give you meaning and purpose outside of drugs. Can you speak to that a little bit? So dr- drugs were commonplace in the Weimar Republic. Also culturally, they were used. Artists would use them. There was a an intense nightlife, uh, for example, in Berlin. Berlin would would attract tourists from all over Europe, actually, for its crazy scene, a little bit like it was again in the 90s and in the first decade of the 21st century. And this all changed, actually, when the when the Nazis did take uh, over. Um, Hitler was portrayed as the first politician in Europe, basically, that enforced a strict anti-drug regime. The drug laws were not changed, so the the old laws from the Weimar Republic were still in place, but now they were being enforced. The Nazis also formed a a specialized police force to combat drug abuse and drug crime. So um, in the beginning, the Nazis actually were very much an anti-drug government. You could even say that they invented the war on drugs because they did throw drug consumers into concentration camps um, from 1933 on onwards already. So in fact, they, 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 they invented this particular aspect of the war on drugs, which is to use prohibitionist laws to um, suppress minorities. So they early on combined their anti-Semitic propaganda with anti-drug propaganda saying that the Jews in Germany would use a lot of drugs and um, you could see that they're not clean, that they're poisonous, poisoning the German people. So uh, anti-Semitism and anti-drug laws went hand in hand. Hitler as the German leader was portrayed as also the leader in a healthy um, way of living. He was portrayed as basically a health saint, um, uh, an anti-alcoholic, anti-smoke. He was anti-smoking. He wouldn't even drink coffee. He didn't even lead a private life. He was portrayed, even though he did, but uh, to the outside world, he was portrayed as this. Yeah, they tried to portray him as this saintly figure who is just working for his people and who has no personal vices or personal interests, even. And this was a highly successful propaganda, and it was it was it was it was at the core of the Nazi belief because the Nazi, the racism, it, it, the, the whole ideology always circled around this idea of health and 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 being clean and being being pure. Uh, it was this this rate this ethnic eth, this, this racist purity that was that was the big goal. And um, so, and, uh, drugs like cocaine and morphine, uh, which had played quite a big role in the Weimar Republic, were now basically eradicated. And the big irony is that in 1937, a new stimulant was developed, and this was methamphetamine. Um, the reason for this were the Olympic Games in 1936 in Berlin, where the American athlete Jesse Owens had won six gold medals. And being Afro-American, this was seen as basically a contradiction to Nazi ideology, because Nazi ideology ideology claimed that Afro-Americans were of an inferior race, certainly inferior compared to the Aryan 
white superhumans. So how could an inferior person run faster and jump jump better than uh, a white uh, super person? So the rumor was that Owens was using a Benzedrine, which was an American product at the time, basically amphetamine. And the owner of the Berlin-based pharmaceutical company, Tembler, advised his chief chemist to develop a better amphetamine, a German answer to amphetamine. So something like Owens winning all the gold medals would never happen again. So this chemist, his name was Fritz Hauschild, developed methamphetamine, which was patented on October 30th, 1937, and came onto the market in 1938 and was not seen as a drug. It was seen as basically a stimulant, a legal stimulant, like uh, a cup of coffee in pill form. And this methamphetamine, which was labeled as pervitin, uh, became a hugely successful product uh, towards the late 30s in Germany. Yeah, it seems to me that the psychology of how the drugs impacted the soldiers really did um, play a role in their early success, specifically when there was that large march across France and there was this absolute disbelief that they could travel so far. Can you speak to that a little bit and the early success of how these drugs played a role? Well, we have to understand that Nazi Germany during the late 30s was nothing, I mean, nothing more is not the correct term, but it was basically a performance-driven capitalist society where it was important to perform well to be you know on the job to to be at your best there was a nazi slogan germany wake up and um, this this methamphetamine helped people to actually wake up and stay awake and be be alert and and, and not be lazy uh, and um, was then taken to the extreme when the army physiologist uh, professor otto ranke uh, responsible for performance enhancement of the German army started reading the first reports that were done on methamphetamine by German universities. These reports were very positive. They claimed that on methamphetamine, uh, you need to sleep less. Your fear level is, is decreased. Your inhibitions are decreased. Um, you basically become more active part of society all these positive things uh, he learned about methamphetamine and then he made the conclusion that maybe this would be a good drug to also enhance the fighting capability of a soldier. So he made tests at the military academy in Berlin before the war started with young medical officers, gave them basically made double blind placebo controlled tests in 1938, um, compared the effects of methamphetamine caffeine and placebos and came to the conclusion that on methamphetamine you need to sleep less and um, this was actually his main and, and other things but this was his main uh, this was the main conclusion that he that he came up with and sleep was his biggest enemy as the army physiologist he had been thinking for quite a while on how to prolong the hours that a soldier can fight without experiencing fatigue. And on methamphetamine, you can actually fight longer. So he suggested to the Surgeon General to um, supply the German troops officially with methamphetamine before the attack on Poland. Surgeon General, who was kind of an old school guy, had no idea what this Professor Ranke, his physiologist, was talking about kind of thought he's crazy or didn't understand it or didn't actually didn't respond to this suggestion. So when Germany attacked Poland, the methamphetamine use of the German army was still chaotic. Since many soldiers, you know, being normal citizens just a week, a few weeks before, had known about Pevitin because it was so, such a popular product in Germany, they had they basically brought it with them to the battlefield and used it because they realized, you know, if I use a stimulant, I might be able to fight better. Um, it might even save my life. So um, methamphetamine abuse or use um, was already quite prominent during the attack on Poland in the fall of 1939. 
Um, Ranke made a survey among medical officers, asked every medical officer in the field to write a report back to him about the possible usage of pevitine. Many reports came back, which I found in the military archive of Germany and studied, and they basically painted a positive picture of methamphetamine. It's, most medical officers said with methamphetamine, all men were able to fight longer. They had less fear to go into uh, battle. So they recommended it. Wow. So before the attack now on France, which came um, about half a year later in the spring of 1940, Ranke again wrote to the Surgeon General. And uh, this time his, his letter or his demand to supply Pevitin as an official drug was accepted. And this had to do with the strategy that Germany would adopt in this campaign. Um, the problem with attacking France had been that basically the French and the British had a superior, those two um, countries combined had a, had a superior um, army uh, than the Germans. They had more soldiers, better weaponry. In a way, there was no there was no chance for Germany to win this this war because if you lead, to lead a successful invasion, you need to be superior in, in armament and manpower and, and all that. So Germany wasn't superior at all. So that's why Hitler's generals were very reluctant to attack in the West. But then three tank generals, one of them would become very famous, Rommel, uh, the other ones were Guderian and von Manstein. They had a meeting with Hitler in February 1940, and they said to him, uh, we have to develop a completely new strategy. We have to not attack in the north of Belgium, where the French and British forces were kind of waiting for the Germans to attack, just like the Germans had attacked in the First World War in the north of Belgium. But we have to go through the Aden Mountains, which is a, a mountainous eye of a needle a little bit south uh, between uh, in, in the south of Belgium. We have to go through there and we have to storm within three days and three nights all the way into French territory and capture the first French city, on, uh, which is which is Sedan. And Hitler thought this plan was amazing um, and said, that's how we're going to do it. So the only problem was how can German soldiers fight for three days and for three nights without stopping. And if you have ever tried to stay awake for three days and three nights without sleeping, you might have found that it's impossible. Um, at least your performance level is going to drop immensely. So how would this be possible? Of course, with methamphetamine, it could be possible. So this is why Ranke's idea to have methamphetamine be delivered to the German troops before they attacked uh, was okayed by the Surgeon General and by the Army High Command. So Temmler, the company who had developed methamphetamine, received an order of 35 million dosages uh, in April 1940 and quickly delivered this huge amount to the German troops. So when they attacked the West on May 10th, 1940, they were all uh, basically tripping on meth and um, were able to carry through with this you know, quite unorthodox way of attack. It's uh, it's kind of famous, like the, the Blitzkrieg. In, in your research, did it seem as though there would be no Blitzkrieg without methamphetamine? Like the, the two were kind of inter intertwined? There's a German medical historian, Dr. Peter Steinkamp, who uh, has this thesis and he examined this um, before I did, and he helped me with my research. And he said that there is no blitzkrieg without methamphetamine. It's obviously hard to say whether that's really true, but I, my findings um, that, uh, that in, in, in Blitz show that this is, actually, this is actually the fact. I don't think the blitzkrieg would have been possible without methamphetamine. They still could have gone through the Ardennes Mountains, but they would have been much slower, uh, which would have meant that the British and French forces would have been able to launch a counterattack. So the strategy to go through the mountains was brilliant, but without methamphetamine, it wouldn't have been so smooth. So I th there might still have been a blitzkrieg, but I don't think the success would have been as smashing as it was. 
Yeah, I think about how when methamphetamines comes to American towns, violence increases, horrible deaths increase, and and the capacity for just very inhumane acts increases. And I'm when I was reading your book, I was thinking to myself about this and about how the the confidence in the soldiers must have been monumental. And you even talk about how they're willing to just die. Um, and then I was reading as well, you were talking about kamikaze pilots were often given methamphetamines as well. And just how it just kind of like... Yeah, um, I mean, it, there's, there's reports that the troops were quite depressed on the day of the advance because they didn't want to fight. They thought we're going to lose again, like in the First World War. But after they swallowed the methamphetamine pills, the mood changed. Um, and they started to believe the, the propaganda that has had been fed uh, all this time that they were actually superior fighters because suddenly they didn't fear anything anymore and, and, and they had one success after the other. They were like doped athletes that would, that would you know, win, win the game. But you don't necessarily, I mean, in a war situation, obviously you get more aggressive. They, they, um, Ranke had to write a so-called stimulant decree which was issued to all the medical officers, which explained what the methamphetamine does. And one of the side effects was aggressive behavior, which I mm-hmm. suppose was a desired side effect, side effect in this case. And it's, it's right what you said, what you say, basically on methamphetamine, you do become more aggressive, but you just become basically, you, you become more active while the drug lasts. I mean, even oh, yeah. in America, in these towns where you know, the, the downtrodden white trash population lives that has nothing left. There's nothing left to do basically than, you know, clean your garage for the 30th time. So you clean your, you clean your garage and you think it's extremely meaningful what you do. So it gives your life a meaning and a soldier, I mean, the soldier's indoctrinated, you know, he's being told that such a great meaning to attack a foreign country and kill all kill everybody. But still a hard thing to believe somehow but if you are on methamphetamine you are more likely to believe it there was this um book that actually references your book by um lucas kamiansky called shooting up the history of drugs and war and he kind of implies but didn't quite go all the way to say this but he implies that meth may have lowered inhibitions and contributed to some of the uh, atrocities, especially like in Poland on, on the Jews there by the German soldiers. Did anything that you found uh, support that hypothesis? Not really, um, it, because there's no studies on how did meth increase violence during battle, because you would have to compare it with soldiers in battle without meth. I mean, it's a fact that the more meth was used, especially in the campaign against the Soviet Union, where hundreds of millions of dosages of meth were being used, the violence increased. And since the German universities I mentioned have proved, could prove that it lowers your inhibitions, it's quite plausible that uh, on meth you commit, it's easier to commit uh, war crimes and atrocities. Um, but it's a speculation. But I think it's fair to say that it's a pretty solid speculation. But I haven't, for example, read any reports on concentration camp guards using crystal meth so they could cope with that job. There's a lot of reports on alcohol abuse by, for example, guards uh, at camp guards. And it was known at the time that alcohol and meth go well together. The you can drink basically more when you're on crystal yep. meth. You don't get as drunk. So these two drugs became the favorite drugs of the of the Germans during the war and certainly contributed to, I would say, uh, atrocities that were that were committed. But I, I wouldn't say that they're the reason actually for these atrocities. The reasons were the uh, racist policies of the regime. Mm-hmm. But I do think it's easier to follow your orders when you're drunk and high on meth than sure. when you're sober or maybe even stoned and just want to go to you know, <laughs> listen to music or something. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about um, Hitler 
and his personal physician, Dr. Morrell, it seems like you did a great job documenting both their relationship and how Dr. Morrell kind of developed these very abnormal treatments. As I was reading it, as I was reading your book, and, you know, he's injecting Hitler with all sorts of things, bull, testicle, you know, um, like so testosterone, opiates, cocaine. It seemed like Hitler was having the effect of it because he was chronically using it. And as the chronicity increased, it kind of reminded me of some of the patients that I've seen over the years who end up in the psychiatric hospital. And then, and then off of it, they just have this complete breakdown where they don't, they just, they just do not function. So I'm curious, like, what are the strongest sources that you found of data to support Dr. Morrell's use of these drugs and which are the drugs that are the, that you're very sure Hitler was on? Well, the best source material are the notes of Morrell himself, which are kept in the Federal Archives of Germany. Morrell was obliged to write down what he gave to Hitler, so he did, and he was quite detailed about it, so you can look at most days between 1936 and 1945 in Morel's um, extensive notes and see what Hitler received on a, on a particular day and under which circumstances and which sometimes also Morel writes what, what political things are happening on that day and why Hitler wants this drug or that drug. So the source material is highly interesting, fascinating, because you get a fly on the wall perspective on the ongoings in the inner circle of the regime for me that was highly fascinating when i when i first read this so in blitz i tried to you know make this come alive so the readers also have this experience of actually being in that most secretive room where hitler discusses that now i have i have to go out to meet these stubborn generals who want me to change my strategy and i feel you know, slightly depressed, but I know I have to, in, in 20 minutes, I have to be on the top of my game. What can you give me so I feel better and more self-confident? And then Morel says, well, we could give you this or that. And, you know, this, these are interesting, very interesting conversations and situations. Um, so what did he give? What did Morel give? Basically, Morel was a, was a, a vitamin pioneer. He was giving vitamins to wealthy clients on Kurfürstendamm, which is the main boulevard of Berlin in the 30s. He was a private doctor, a Dr. Feelgood, basically, one of the first ones of his kind, um, a jovial, chubby house doctor with, with uh, extremely trained skills uh, in giving injections. He did not believe in oral applications, but in intravenous and intramuscular applications, because that's faster. So he would give his patients high dosages of vitamin vitamins in, you know, shots. And um, also he, he used probiotics, which Hitler also liked. Hitler and Morel met through a mutual friend, Hoffmann, who was the photographer of Hitler and who had been a patient of Morel. And who one day said, I have to introduce you to a good friend of mine. Your methods of treatment would highly interest this friend of mine. And this friend was Hitler. So there was a, a dinner in 1936 in Hoffmann's home where Morel and Hitler met for the first time and then immediately uh, got along well. And because Hitler had a, had, had a big problem with um, his digestion. He had, he had gas and he uh, was you know, suffering from bloating and, uh, and, and, and Morel gave him probiotics and it actually helped him. So Hitler appointed him as personal physician. And then Morel was basically with the dictator every day from 1936 to 1945. Uh, certainly spent more time with Hitler than anybody else and um, developed a very intimate relationship with him. They basically became codependent on each other. And in the first five years until 1941, Morel basically stuck to his guns and gave him vitamins and probiotics. And Hitler was quite healthy, never was ill. Every day on the job, 
um, they developed the concept of the instant recovery. So if Hitler you know, had to stand outside uh, at a parade and it was raining and he would always wear his, his thin brown uniform because he thought he's most, this, this is the, the best looking uniform he could wear even when the weather was not allowing for it basically. So he would just receive like a huge doses of vitamin C before he would go out into the cold. And so he, he, and he actually didn't get a cold or, or anything at all. Uh, until 41, uh, in the August of 1941, during the attack against the Soviet Union, Hitler had dysentery, the so-called Russian flu. He had to stay in bed. He had a high fever. And this was this came at a crucial point in time during the advance because his generals, who always were in conflict, actually, with Hitler, they always... I mean, there was ne- it was never, you know, a good relationship between Hitler and the high command of his army. So the army wanted, the high command wanted to attack Moscow. Germany was quite close already to, to Moscow. Like it, it would have been possible to capture Moscow, but Hitler wanted to split the troops, go towards the north to Leningrad and towards the south to, to, to the oil reserves of the Soviet Union. He thought that was a better way to continue the campaign. So there was a huge conflict of interests, and Hitler was ill. He had to stay in bed, and um, he was afraid that the generals would move ahead without him because decisions had to be made. You know, decisions were made in the military briefing room. They were not made in, in Hitler's bed, basically. So he said to Morel, I need something stronger this time than vitamins, and he received an opioid for the first time, a Dolantin, the German product, and uh, it immediately eradicated his symptoms. Uh, he got out of bed and walked into the briefing room and was able to you know, continue dictating the advance. And from that moment on, the, the vitamin therapy and treatments were interspersed with other stuff. Um, not only opioids, because Morel was reluctant with opioids because he knew they are habit forming. So, but Hitler wanted more, more and more often uh, as the war against the Soviet Union became more and more difficult. Hitler wanted stronger stuff than vitamins more and more often. So, what Morel in the beginning, or from 1941 till about 1943, did was give him uh, steroids um, and uh, these animal uh, concoctions, these thyroid glands extracts and pigs liver extracts and bulls testicle drops and weird stuff that he actually fabricated himself in his own. Um, he, he he had an own pharmaceutical uh, company and farm and and, and fabricate uh, plant. Um, so he ex- experimented quite a bit on Hitler and Hitler enjoyed that he was he was ready to test new things and these were actually dangerous things because they were not really you know they were not tested by, i mean hitler was the the guinea pig uh, in a way um so that there was there's what there was one episode when germany had occupied the ukraine morel tried to get and did get the monopoly on all the organs of all the slaughtered animals in all the slaughterhouses of the Ukraine. These organs were shipped to his company in occupied Czech Republic, where he then uh, turned these organs into all kinds of strange products that Hitler thought would increase his energy level and his performance level. So Hitler tried a lot of these things out, which I think led to his physical decline. Um, and with this physical decline that became more and more apparent, especially in 1943 and 1944, Hitler needed you know, even stronger medicines. And um, in July of 1943, before an, a decisive meeting with Mussolini, he asks Morel again for a wonder drug because he feels depressed and doesn't want to take the meeting. Um, and Morel then, after you know, consulting with himself, gives him quite a powerful opioid, which was branded as Oikodal at the time. It was a German product by the Merck company. It had the active ingredient is, um, is uh, oxycodone or oxycontin, I think it's called now in the United States. So it's the very drug that has led to the so-called opioid crisis or contributed to the so-called opioid crisis in the United States was at the time a German product and was 
given to Hitler, not as a pill, but again as, a, as an injection mm. of 10 milligrams uh, on this day in, in July. And Hitler responded probably like everyone else would have quite strongly to this you know, very strong drug that was shot into his vein. Uh, it made him euphoric. It made him clear-headed. It made him feel wonderful. And we can see that from that day on, the Oikoda is being used quite often. Um, there's, for example, the month of September 1944, where Hitler receives 20 milligrams of Oikoda intravenously every second day, which is obviously habit-forming and turned him into uh, what I call in my book a junkie and is certainly the strongest drug application that uh, Hitler takes in the course of his political career and downfall. Okay, so what about cocaine or methamphetamines? Is there, was there any hint? Because it sounded like with, the, with his teeth issues, that sounds more like methamphetamines. But were you, were you not seeing that in the records? No, all, I mean, basically Hitler took a lot of drugs. Uh, there's over 90 medications that he used and he used a lot of them at the sa on the same day. So he, he would, his morale was not really concerned with, you know, cross effects of medicines. He was yep. not really thinking about that. So um, Hitler was receiving quite a crazy cocktail. Uh, the, 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 op the opioids were the strongest medicine that he used uh, in tr because they, they were applied in high dosages intravenously. But he, there was rumors that he also used methamphetamine. Since Morel wrote down every medication that he gave Hitler, never writes, well, he writes methamphetamine twice. There's two, two times he mentions it. And I don't really see a reason why he would give it more often and, and not mention it, but it it can't be ruled out, but he only he only writes about it twice. So I don't really think he was a meth addict. I mean, there was one, he received a, a vitamin preparation from Morel, which Morel fabricated himself. And this, as, as doctor claimed that in, in that fabrication also was methamphetamine, but there was never any proof for it. So I don't, if there's no proof, I, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know, you know, there's no proof. Um, he did take cocaine at one point after the bomb attack on July 20th, 1944, when Stauffenberg tried to kill him in Operation Valkyrie. Hitler was actually quite injured. He had hundreds of wooden splinters from this bomb blast uh, in his body. So, And his eardrums were blown. Both of his eardrums were bleeding and blown. So um, a, a, an ear specialist came into uh, headquarters and prescribed Hitler cocaine for about a month. So Hitler did use cocaine, but it was more like during that special situation after the attack. But I mean, the doctor, this, this other doctor who came in and he was later interrogated by the Americans and gave this report that I studied about the cocaine. He was quite surprised how ready Hitler was to kind of jump into a new drug. He suddenly found cocaine. He thought cocaine is the best drug in the world. And he was high on cocaine for over a month. But then he kind of resorted back to his opioids. He preferred, he, he was more the opioid guy than a cocaine guy. Yeah, it seemed like when uh, Germany is finally successfully being invaded and the supply lines are taken down and Hitler can't get access to a lot of these drugs and, you know, the drugs dried up, so to speak, it seems like he had this huge come down that, and you document that in the book and sort of his um, angry rants that he goes on reminded me of some meth or just people detoxing, you know, how irritable they get. I don't know, any thoughts about that, the sort of come down that he had and the days that it happened in? Well, Morel doesn't give him the opioids anymore starting January 1st, 1945. So for four months, Hitler is suddenly on, you know, without his opioids, a drug that he has become physically addicted to before. So obviously he goes into withdrawal, um, which probably was highly unpleasant. 
because he was also in this terrible bunker underneath um, the earth in Berlin. And he was losing uh, World War II. So you can imagine that uh, he felt pretty shitty. So this is the famous, you know, last weeks and months in the bunker where Hitler is just becoming like this unbearable, also somehow ridiculous human wreck that just, you know, rants and, and, and shouts and screams and, and breaks down and is not able to, you know, conduct any, you know, sensible defense strategy against the advancing Red Army. So yeah, this is um, this is the last chapter of the life of the dictator and also of the you know the whole dictatorship, so-called Third Reich in Germany. There was uh, in the last section of as you're talking about that, like you, you uh, have this quote of um, like you know Hitler could go on taking as many drugs as he liked to keep himself in a state in which he could commit his crimes. It does not diminish his monstrous guilt. And I, and I love that because that's a question, you know, as psychiatrists that we're always called in to testify on is, did the drugs cause them to do the crimes or was it, you know, just a parallel process? And so kind of the, the, the story that I kind of see you, you painting is one of, you know, Hitler was already, you know, committed to these evil, rigid actions and the drugs might have just enhanced what was already present. Is, is that kind of what you intended to convey? Absolutely. Um, the drugs did not create his racist ideas or his, you know, the genocide against the Jews. This was all actually created in his head when he was quite sober and um, commanding all his senses. This was this was, this is already laid out in his book. Mein Kampf, which he wrote when he was quite young, even before he became chancellor and later leader of Germany. Um, but what the drugs did, especially the opioids, the euphoric making opioids, was to kind of keep him on track and give him the artificial strength that he needed to mm. you know, not change his mind and just keep going with this tunnel vision that he once had created. So the drugs kind of prevented him from breaking down, having second thoughts, becoming depressed and maybe, you know, stepping back, something like that. You know, other people might have, you know, stepped back once you, lo you lose the battle of Stalingrad, but Hitler just took more drugs and, and, and was, you know, and, and, and kept, kept on going and kept on being convincing and, and, and really was convincing. I mean, his generals were sure that he had wonder weapons up his sleeve because he just told them in such a charismatic way um, that, of course, Germany would uh, win the war. But this, this charisma was artificially enhanced by the drugs. Yeah. Yeah, I think about the chronic use of the drugs and how it changes receptor density and how in that process you get like when you, when you get off of it, you have decreased, you know, normal amounts of impact of hormones like dopamine. If you have, you know, the receptor density decreases, you, you don't have the ability to normally have what would be normal confidence. It would be like much lower. And so you have this sort of deep, profound insecurities mm. um, that I often see in deep anxieties, deep fears. So, I was thinking about that with like the German soldiers, how they're, you know, as the chronicity of the use of the drugs, like methamphetamines for the soldiers kind of war as, as that went on, you know, and kind of like what that led to was a soldier that's much less impactful. Did you see a breakdown in the general soldier's ability as time went on with the drug use and the chronicity? Well, the, the Wehrmacht became aware of this problem and tried to install a huge rehab program to examine and counter these effects, but this never really got off the ground. Um, what did get off the ground was a program by the Luftwaffe, the Air Force. They 
installed special clinics for pilots that had been using too much methamphetamine and were not able to continue flying uh, missions. So they had to go into rehab. So yes, this effect obviously you know, took place in the German military uh, establishment, try to deal with it as much as they could, but uh, it was difficult. I mean, the whole the whole war became so difficult that at one point it was just uh, it just turned into chaos and an utter defeat. Yeah. Let's see. One one more question we had was, what happened to drug use after the downfall of Germany? Well, there was still a lot of pervitin available. Um, it came. It it. it flowed from the supplies of the Wehrmacht, who no long, which no longer existed, um, onto the black market, which was ruling the economy in Germany right after the war. So pervitin was available, um, was used also to boost morale after the horrible defeat. So for people to you know, gather some kind of energy to rebuild their country, pervitin was still being used. So pervitin continued to be a popular medication or drug during the late 40s uh, and 50s and was only kind of declining in popularity during the 60s when new drugs like the psychedelic drugs or marijuana became more popular. Okay. I think you like you wrote about like they're giving it to like women as it, it is they're like sitting through the rubble trying to like you know, rebuild, is that, is that kind of indicative of the use of that reconstruction? Yeah, era? These, these women were the so-called debris women, the Trümmerfrauen. They were, they're kind of a myth in Germany that these women, you know, cleaned all the rubble and rebuilt the cities, which is, you know, partly true um, because the men were all dead or, you know, too weak to do anything. So, and, and these women apparently used quite a lot of pevitin to be able to, you know, Keep on going for 12, 14 hours a day. Hmm. Tell, tell us a little bit about your interests. Like, how did you get interested in this topic? I was approached by a friend of mine whose uh, friend uh, had uh, found all pervitin pills in an old apartment in Berlin. They were 70 years old and they tried them, uh, being adventurous Berliners. And oh. they, <laughs> they were like, Oh, wow. Bad long stimulating effect and when he told me this i started researching because i thought that story is too peculiar not to, to be looked at and then i found a topic for my book nice well thank you so much for your time and uh yeah. you know if you're if you're listening to this and you're curious i think the audi audible version of your book blitzed is very very easy to get through it is full of more details and if you listen to this uh, podcast i think you would be interested in you know normally when we think of drugs of abuse we think of like black market we don't think of nations prescribing utilizing it for war mm. and so i think this is a helpful or just just kind of an eye opening i don't know it's kind of dark at the same time as i read it it's like it's like a it's like reading sort of the dark side of, you know, mankind and what, the, what we're capable of. So I think it's important to understand that, to be able to not allow history to repeat. Any, any closing remarks, any closing thoughts that you have? Well, I think we just um, should try to uh, use our influence upon our governments to stop the war on drugs because it's just a senseless uh, endeavor that um, creates uh, suffering and is not really helping neither the sick nor the uh, health, so-called healthy um, members of our society. So let's just stop this stupid war that a president called Nixon once started. Yeah. Okay. If uh, if people wanted to read more of your works, where where can we where can we find you online? We can have a look at normanola.com. There's another book that I wrote called The Bohemians, which is about resistance against the uh, Nazi regime in Berlin during the late 30s and 40s. So you can also check check that one out. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your That's time. Important. Thank you. 
All right. So I am really glad to have Adam Brecky here with me. And we're doing kind of a post episode analysis. And I thought, Adam, you could kind of start to talk about where amphetamines came from, the history of it a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a good place to start. We're going back in time. So Los Angeles, the year is, uh, you know, early 20th century. There's this uh, chemist working in the back room of a pharmacy who's uh, working on various treatments for the common cold, looking for uh, decongestants specifically. Because, you know, like Sudafed, ephedrine, things that constrict the blood vessels, dry up a uh, runny nose. He um, came up with some chemicals, you know, in his little O-chem lab and uh, tried one on himself. And he was up for three nights straight and thought it was the greatest thing ever. So that was one of the first times uh, that amphetamine uh, was ever tried in a human. And then pretty soon after that, he got a big drug company called uh, Smith, Klein and French to kind of buy his patent. And they would sell amphetamines as inhalers. But then pretty soon that kind of expanded. And, you know, a lot of us don't know this in the mental health field, but amphetamines were literally the first marketed antidepressants um, ever, you know, way preceding, you know, tricyclics or, or really anything else. Yeah, because, you know, it's almost instantaneous when you take it, you feel more confident, you feel some euphoria, increased sex drive, increased activity, decreased fatigue. So a lot of these things for the short term, makes sense on like, oh, this, this is helpful. The problem is, is like kind of the escalating dose over time and the abuse and misuse, which is hard to not enter into. Okay. Keep going. So, I mean, most people, most clinicians have an association in their head between, you know, stimulants like Ritalin, amphetamine, Adderall and ADHD. And so I think it's just worth mentioning kind of where that came from. There's this psychiatrist in Rhode Island named Charles Bradley. And in the, in the late thirties, he's working in this home for like, you know, troubled young boys. And um, he's experimenting, experimenting and tries out Benzedrine, which is, you know, um, amphetamine. And lo and behold, he found that the week after he's given him this drug, that these troublesome boys are really well-behaved. They're focusing, they're less, they're fighting less. And that kind of really begins the uh, use of uh, stimulants as a treatment for ADHD. Yeah. And so um, use the word Benzedrine. And I mentioned earlier in the intro that Benzedrine was used by U.S. troops. And it was usually around five milligrams of tablet. Tell me a little bit about what's in Benzedrine. Yeah, so when we when we use the word amphetamine, we're really talking about um, a molecule that's that's an ion, and that can really be um, synapse. Like it, it kind of binds to various other, you know, ions to form a salt. So, like Adderall, for example, is if you pres- prescribe the generic version, it won't be called Adderall. It'll be called mixed amphetamine salts. So there's four different kind of variants of the you know amphetamine molecule matched up with a different salt. So benzedrine is amphetamine, it's pure amphetamine, but in if you remember your organic chemistry you have enantiomers. So you have the dextro and the le- levo versions of the same molecule. So Benzedrine is a perfect, or they call it racemic, or 50-50 split of the right-handed D-amphetamine and the left-handed uh, L-amphetamine. So this was the first one on the market. And what they eventually found out that was kind of interesting was that for some reason, the D-amphetamine was much more potent. So people got a little bit more of a rush from it. Um, they got a little bit higher, and it's more effective in ADHD. So Adderall, for context, unlike Benzedrine, it's 75-25 D to L. And then even today, you can prescribe pure D amphetamine, and that drug is called uh, Desedrine. Yeah. So 
just to reiterate, so you have this uh, this benzene ring, ring of six carbons, you know, with some double bonds, single bonds, and then you have a carbon coming off of that, and then another carbon, and then you have like um, a nitrogen, an NH2 group, and then a, another carbon. So it's like, does that NH2 group go, you know, in a right-handed or a left-handed formation? And then if you have on that NH2 group another carbon coming off of that, that makes it a meth, an extra meth group. So that's methamphetamine. And so that's how you get the different right and left-handed things. You know, and so remember when you have four different things coming off of one place, it's, it, it's like it's, it could be right or left-handed. So that's, that's what's going on there. Okay, so then what else did you find as you were kind of looking at this in terms of like what makes the difference between methamphetamines and amphetamines? Yeah, it's worth like answering this in detail just because I can't tell you how many times I've been asked by a parent, I'm trying to, you know, prescribe a stimulant to an ADHD kid and they want to know, the parent wants to know what the difference is between, you know, methamphetamine somebody's going to use on the street and the drug, the Adderall that I'm trying to give them. So, you know, short answer is the methyl group you just mentioned. Something magical about that group makes these, you know, different than amphetamine. So it's amphetamine plus a special methyl group. You get methamphetamine. So a couple things, and it's a little bit mixed. So, well, well, let me, let me just add one more thing in there. The simple answer is orders of magnitude of amount. That, that would be my simple answer to parents. So for example, you know, in, even in the military, these German soldiers are using three to five tablets, which is nine to 15 milligrams of meth. And some are reported as high as 100. Okay, so that was kind of the max that I could see. Whereas like on the street, 300 to 800 milligrams per day is kind of what's being used. And, and so there's that. There's also the speed of delivery. On the street, they're injecting it, which gets it in so much faster. So, and snorting it. Yeah, no, that's, that's really it. The two things, root of administration, you want to bypass the first pass metabolism so it gets in the brain quicker. And that's really what's correlated with getting high, right? So any drug can kind of get that stimulating or produces dopamine or an opioid effect is more addictive if it's shorter acting and the time from injection to brain is shorter. So you smoke meth, you inject meth, it's, it's going way quicker than if you were to take it orally. Yeah. And it's like a 25, they're using, people on the street are using 25 times the amount, you know, on a, on the, as we prescribe for ADHD. So that's certainly worth paying attention to the, you know, the poison is in the dose, if you will. The, the neurotoxicity, you know, I mean, you have lots of studies of people who use these ADHD medication for ADHD and they have lower rates of car accidents. They have lower rates of other drug use. They have, you know, they're, they're doing a lot better in school. So there's, there's evidence that these can be helpful at low doses for people with ADHD. The other thing about methamphetamines I wanted to mention was the mechanism of action. So Adam, explain the mechanism of methamphetamines for those who are listening. Yeah. So it's the amphetamine molecule, uh, similar to the methamphetamine molecule, uh, competitive inhibitor, and it's kind of a pseudo substrate for the norepinephrine transporter and the dopamine transporter, which are just kind of chilling in the, you know, the presynaptic membrane. It's what's responsible for, you know, bringing the stuff back into the, the neuron after it's released. So, so if it inhibits that, you're going to have more norepinephrine nor dopamine in the, the cleft. So for this postsynaptic action, that's what, that's where you get the high, However, at higher doses, so we're talking about addiction range here, it's actually transported into the presynaptic dopamine terminal. And that's when it actually competitively inhibits the VMAT2 receptor, which we may remember from uh, one of the tardive dyskinesia drugs, and as well as Parkinsonism. So it actually displaces dopamine within the VMAT you know, vesicle, 
And then you have this flood of dopamine that just surges into the synapse. And because you have such a huge different like difference in concentration, the, the dopamine transporter reverses directions. So suddenly it, the concentration floods out into you know the synapse, which causes insane, it's like a feedback thing. So insane concentrations hitting the postsynaptic, you know, receptors leading to kind of euphoria, psychosis, you know, all the good, but also all the bad things associated with it. Yeah. So essentially the way that I understand this is you're like, you're not bringing the dopamine back in for another normal, pleasurable thing, you know, connecting with others, accomplishing something, that sort of thing. You're not bringing the dopamine back into the presynaptic neuron Instead, you're just pushing that dopamine out of the vesicles, which are in that presynaptic neuron, and then out of the dopamine transporter. So instead of the dopamine transporter bringing it back into the cell, it's actually pushing it out so that you have this intense, intense surge of dopamine for you know extended periods of time that brings incredible pleasure in the short term. And often these patients that I see who are coming in crashing, they're sleeping, they're irritable, they're not happy, they have no pleasure. And they just look like just tired and worn out and like the lights aren't quite on. And so, you know, when you have 500, 600, 700 milligrams a day, of methamphetamines, it just causes this chronic damage to the brain. And, you know, you could see pictures of, of people's brains that are damaged. There's all sorts of studies on different areas of the brain that get damaged from long-term use. And like, you know, it, it, it causes um, all sorts of issues. What Did you find anything else in your research on, for example, how people are abusing Adderall in schools? Yeah, so that's really kind of one of the questions that Norman Oller's book brought up was, is there like an upside to recreational use, right? So I think most med students out there at least know people that are using Adderall to cram for tests and things like that, stay up a little late, do these crazy study sessions. It's it's really interesting, right? So we can talk about risks a little bit later, but in terms of just who is using it and why, there was this interesting 2008 review of the misuse of prescription stimulants. So they reviewed 21 articles over the course of 10 years. Um, they found that 16% of children in a sample of, this is grade school. So this is grade school. were asked to either give, sell, or trade their Adderall when they were prescribed it. Um, a bunch of them, like 4% had their meds stolen. When we get to uh, like college age students, you it, it's really interesting because you have the people that are misusing them. So the ones that are buying it from their friends, they're overwhelmingly likely to have ADHD symptoms, even though no formal diagnosis. So in other words, they're getting ADHD meds from their friends to treat potentially undiagnosed ADHD. But here's the weird thing, right? So amongst those who do misuse, in other words, they don't have a prescription for it. 60% said they're using it to study. 48% uh, said alertness. About 31 said uh, to get high. And then another 30% just were like, hey, I want to experiment. And then another interesting thing about this study was a lot of those who did, you know, misuse it, almost 60% met criteria for conduct disorder. Um, and another 75% for substance use disorder. So if you find Adderall misuse, if you keep fishing, you're very likely to find, you know, other substances as well. Yeah. Whenever I prescribed it to someone in college, I always said to them, don't tell any of your friends that you have it, number one. And number two, just realize it's illegal to sell it or to give it to someone who doesn't have a prescription. And um, I would not want anything bad to happen to you. So I think that my worry as I like listen to this book and think about some students and their behaviors is that you could literally stay up for multiple days using these substances. 
and I think I think that is inevitably toxic on the brain. Like our brains were not meant to stay up for several days straight. Think about um, just how toxic that could be to just not sleep for several days straight and just be going, going, going. When I read the book, it kind of made sense that their confidence was really, really high. You take a bunch of naive people and you put them on this and you tell them to march and it's like they're already in great physical shape. They already believe this sort of dogma that they've been fed their whole lives. And then you put them on these these drugs and then they just it just takes them to that next level, right? Where it just pushes them to do things that you wouldn't expect. I think part of me was like, you know, we have this kind of distaste for for Nazi Germany, obviously. But then as I was like reading this further after this book, I realized, oh, they were giving, you know, amphetamines to American soldiers. How do I feel about that? Oh yeah. Yeah. No one, no one is innocent of substance enhancement, but you know, it's, it's fun knocking on the Nazis though. (laughs) Well, it's, um, it's easy, right? It's like, if you don't like someone, you compare them to a Nazi somehow. Right. That's like, that's like an insult of sorts. Okay. So big takeaways, any big takeaways from this whole sort of saga? Yeah. I think like for me, one principle of prescribing is just that like what goes up must come down. So if you're using something like Adderall, like you're essentially dealing with borrowed time. So if you're a student and you're doing the Adderall thing, you're using up neurotransmitters that will have to be rejuvenated at some point. So being on just as the Nazi soldiers would march for three days um, and it worked because France was able to literally fall in just a few days. But as we saw in the Russia part where it's taken literally months, the whole meth induced blitzkrieg really failed. So just a word of caution for uh, the long term use is there are consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, um, I would say that, you know, think about the orders of magnitude for a, you know, people who are using it on the street versus people who are using it in the classroom. I I think it's good to be cautious with our prescriptions to not just hand it out, but really consider, does this person need it? We know that performance will be enhanced period, like whether you have ADHD or not. And the, you know, alertness will be enhanced, ability to study longer, focus. But there's been a number of people that I've seen over the years where I've actually slowly got them off of this or got them off of the dose that they were on. And part of it was just to get them back to a healthier place. So I think there is kind of some nuance and like a sweet spot with some of these things where it's like too much will not help them you know, and sometimes they don't need it. Right. So some people get misdiagnosed with ADHD when there's other things going on. Sometimes it's like chronic stress, you know, it's like, okay, what do we do with someone with chronic stress? Do we give them ADHD so they can perform in school? It might help a little bit, but it might also be better just to treat like what's the underlying issue of underneath the chronic stress. Um, same with like sleep problems, you know, sleep apnea, you have a lot of the same symptoms of inattention, lack of focus, but you just want, you want to solve the underlying issue as opposed to just band-aiding the fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. And then one of my thoughts with the Hitler, I know we haven't talked about him too much at the end here, but you know, you have someone who had some really bad ideas and then I think the drugs allowed him to kind of not question how bad his ideas were. So like, for example, in his conversation with Mussolini, having taken, what was it, cocaine and stuff right before, elevated him to such an extent that he was able to convince Mussolini to keep going in the war. You, you remember that probably better than I do. Yeah. There, there were so many points in which the whole Nazi project was... At, there were these critical junctures where it all could have ended way earlier with almost millions of less loss of lives, but drugs kept him going. So I'm, I'm not sure. 
I'm as ready to say that drugs were responsible for his ideology, but I certainly think that they propped up, they, they propped up his resolve to kind of finish what he started. Yeah, it's awful, you know, and so part of us, it's like, we can almost like try to create some laughter around this to try to defend against the awfulness of it all. But I think we have real questions about how we want to operate in this world in the future, you know? Like, I'm very concerned that someone who is on something like, you know, methamphetamines or Adderall, like, they're just going to be more violent. They're, they're just going to be more confident. They're going to be overly confident. They may even, you know, hypersexual. Like, th- I've, I've had a number of, of clients who behave in sexual ways on these drugs in ways that they normally wouldn't, and they, they hurt themselves. I had one patient who get HIV when he used meth um, during kind of like a, a, a sex binge of sorts. And so, you know, I think there's real um, pause that we should have as we sort of think about the this class of medication and the class of like uppers and how they're used and abused and the real side effects that exist. All right, we will leave it there for today. We will be putting some of these notes in uh, on the website, psychiatrypodcast.com. You can eat in the resource library. I really do hope you pick up his book because I, I, I think it was it was wonderful. We will link his book. And the Audible is very easy to get through. I know a lot of you are commuters. And so, yeah, let me know your thoughts if you get through it. If you have different thoughts than we have I'd love, or the same thoughts, you could let me know. Sometimes when people sign up for the resource library, they just jot a little note down to me on something and I appreciate it. So thank you, Adam. We'll leave it there for today. 